great. Okay. Hey, Todd. How you doing, Steve? Before we just started recording, you were telling me you've been in LA for 25 years. Yeah, I moved here in um, Halloween of 1998. So coming up on 25. Okay, I was there from 84 to about 96. But I was in New York a little bit during that time. In okay. fact, we could talk about this later, but I re just remembered it. I saw Bullet La Volta at the Whiskey. It was with a three-band tour. I can't remember who the other two bands That were. would be with... A new, um, one was a New York band that sounded like a Southern rock band. It was Well, we were with Prong, I think, and Corrosion Prong. of Conformity, COC. Oh. Oh yeah, that show I saw too. But I think I saw another one where you guys okay. you, you played the whiskey more than once with the band, right? Yeah, I mean, we played in LA a lot. I mean, in 1989 we swung through here, and I think we did like five separate shows in a week. Like it was, we played with Suicidal one night. We played with the Pandoras one night. Um, I think the Fluid, Mud Honey, maybe Raging Slab or someone like Raging that. Raging Slab. That's yeah. the band that's New York that sounds yeah. like a Southern. Yeah, I was at that show, too. Because we were but, both on RCA. At yeah, right, yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, right. Because you joined around 19. Yeah, well, we'll get into that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you some stuff about your background for us, because yeah. I don't really know. We don't know each other very well, even though I've seen you play. We, I don't think we've ever formally met. I don't think but so. Where did you grow up? I grew up just north of Boston in Linfield. Which Linfield. is uh, yeah, yeah. It's the Wickfield. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess there's some kind of um shopping destination there now that didn't exist when I was a kid. Like I always hear about these people going to Linfield for some like outlet mall or something. I don't know what it is, but um <laughs> I, I I know a lot of hockey players used to live there. I used to hear that a lot of hockey Bruins players lived in Linfield. Totally. Um Ken Hodge lived right near me from the 70s Bruins yeah. and then um, on my way to school, I would pass by Mike Milbury's house every night, <laughs> every day. Um, yeah, a lot of Bruins <laughs> lived there. So um, what was it like growing up there? It was odd. Um, I, I wasn't crazy about it. It was like, you know, 70s suburb kind of, I think a lot of organized crime. There was a lot of like Nuba <laughs> Reach houses there, you know, like very <laughs> Sopranos. Um yeah. And, you know, I was just like a frustrated, you know, I got into punk rock like around eighth grade and the, you know, the kids in Linfield definitely were not into that <laughs> there. So um, I felt a little bit like an outcast and um, yeah, it was, it was, I, I didn't love it. Like when I look back on, on Linfield, I was not crazy about it. And then I went to uh, boarding school in New Hampshire for high school and that was great. Like that changed my life. Like everybody there was like into great music and like super artistic and it was just a, a completely different, different what school scene. was that it was brewster academy which is uh, in wolfboro new hampshire yeah, yeah. good one right Real yeah good school. yeah it was great no no at that point were you already like thinking about music i mean like i was going to ask you like when did you start list what's the earliest music you can remember listening to i got into classic rock really young i had an older sister and um my parents were actually into, you know, they were into folk music. Um, but I would say around age 10, you know, I became obsessed with Led Zeppelin. I heard the ocean and uh, it was a huge gateway for me. <laughs> it kind of changed my life. Like the second I heard the ocean by Led Zeppelin, I, I kind of thought in my head, like, this is exactly what I want to do. I just want to play music like this. Um, were you already playing the drums at that I was point? playing drums and like in school band, you know, like concert band and jazz band and uh, marching band. Um, in eighth grade, I joined the, the high school marching band and that was huge for me. Um, that really got my chops going. And then, so I was a classic rock kid. You know, I loved the kinks and the who and the doors and the Beatles and the Stones and all the stuff you're supposed to like and Skinner and... <laughs> Uh, my dad took me to see the kinks when I was in like sixth grade and that was a real game changer for me. Um, and then it was like one summer I got um, Ziggy Stardust and London Calling 
and that thing started to change. Like, yeah, it was the summer of London Calling. And then, I do you remember Night Flight on USA Network? Night Flight, yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, one night I was staying up late. I, I was probably twelve years old or thirteen years old, and um, I saw a Clash video for Radio Clash, and they showed excerpts from The Decline, which had just come out, and so I mm -hmm. saw clips of Black Flag and X, and. Uh, it was like game over. Like, <laughs> like I sold all my classic rock records, just totally submerged myself into punk rock and hardcore at that point. And, so were um, you were you paying attention to the drummers as far back as when you heard Bonham the first time? Because you said totally. Zeppelin. Yeah. So was he was he one of your big early influences? Huge influence. I loved Keith Moon, uh, Mitch Mitchell. Um. Yeah, those three were sort of my big my big influences at the beginning. That's interesting how you got classic and then you went into the punk. Um, wh wh which drums do you think more kind of influenced your style? Was it the classic rock guys or was it when you started listening to the, the later stuff? I'd say it was a hybrid of Bonham and like Bill Stevenson from Black Flag and oh, Descendants. Yeah. His, if you listen to the shit, you know, I did with LaVolta, like it's very Bill Stevenson, like super snare, super fast, you know, uh, a lot of rudiments on the snare drum and um, I loved him. I thought he was amazing. Uh, I was, if we want to jump ahead in the story, um, so I, I, got, I was really into hardcore, you know, everything you're supposed to be into, MDC, you know, fucking Circle Jerks, Black Flag, Seven Seconds, all of that. And as I, as I got older, I wanted something a little more. And I went into Rocket Records and um, Al Quint. Dog is... <laughs> yeah, well, that's I, a, you know, I grew up Al's right a good there. friend of mine. Al's a good Al's guy. awesome, and I was yeah. just like, Al, I'm looking for something with like a little more brains, you know, um, <laughs> not so campy. And he he laid the Moving Targets record on me, uh, Burning Heart. And those guys, I mean, the rhythm section of the Targets, Pat Leonard and Pat Brady, the drummer. Um, I mean, they could have been in Mahavishnu or something. I mean, they were such good players. Yeah. Um, so I got that Targets record and I couldn't believe how proficient they were and how great the songwriting was. Like I felt like Kenny's songs were um as good as any Husker Du song I'd heard at that point. You know, just the songwriting was so still so making sweet. great records. Oh too. my god, I know. So I went to a Dag Nasty show. I guess it was the spring of 87. Um, I was a junior in high school and went to an all ages Dag Nasty show at TT the Bears and uh, Kenny was there and I had heard, I'd either heard or read in either Triple X or Suburban Voice that Pat Brady had quit the targets. Um, and so I just walked up straight up to Ken Chambers and I was like 17 years old, junior in high school. And I just said, I heard your drummer quit. I don't know if you're still going to continue, but I know that record backwards and forwards and I'd love to to play with you. And he gave me an, an audition and um, I joined the targets that summer in between my junior and senior year of high school. <laughs> That's incredible. Cause I was just talking to Curtis a, a, about a week and a half ago and I mentioned, I was going to have you on mm -hmm. and he said, Oh, well, you got to talk about moving targets with him. And yeah. then I was thinking, I didn't know he. I didn't know that you ever played in in Moving Targets. I didn't see it listed. In, you didn't play on any records. I didn't play on any records, so I don't list it in my bio. But um, it was basically just like a six month period. Um, because like I said, I was still in high school, so I had to go back up to New Hampshire and go to school, finish wow. up my senior year of high school. But um, both Pat Brady and Pat Leonard had quit, and um, Kenny was playing in um, Dreadful in the Din with Jeff Wagon yeah, from the yeah, Volcano yeah, yeah. Sons. So yeah, Kenny he... was on my show, by the way. You're not the first ex at LaVolta guy, okay. sorry. But... Well, I love Kenny. <laughs> we, we talk often. So he got Jeff Wagon from Volcano Sons to play bass. And I was a big Sons fan. So when I went to that first, I guess it was an audition. Um, I'm just like this young kid. I'd never, you know, met. I thought these guys were like rock stars to me. You know, I thought they were famous. <laughs> You know, when you're, you know, I, when you're I love, yeah, and I love, I love that you met at a Dag Nasty show because yeah. I, I used to run Giant Records, so I put out the Field Day record oh, yeah. and All Ages show EP, and I think it was around that time because '87 was Peter Cortner was singing by then, right? It was Peter, and I think that Doug. lineup was Doug and maybe London May on drums. Yeah, London he did that one tour with them. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. So I go down. Um, Kenny tells me to meet them. Uh, uh, Looney Tunes on Boylston Street. There's yeah, a yeah. sub basement underneath, like two floors beneath the surface. And um, I go down there and like all these people who I think are rock stars were rehearsed down there. Like Del Fuegos were down there. Scruffy the Cat. Volcano Sons, the Zulus, and uh, we set up in this room. I think we were waiting for Jeff Wagon to get there, and I'm sitting on a uh, like a van bench, you know, like a bench seat that used to be in a van. Yeah. And I'm sitting on it, and I it, I realize all of a sudden that I'm sitting in the exact position that the guys in Mission of Burma are sitting in the uh, in the inside of Versus. It was the <laughs> old Burma rehearsal space. And I'm, wow. I know. And I'm sitting on that bench. And like Mission of Burma, they were the most important band to me ever, you yeah. know, still to this day. Um, so I sort of realized where I'm, where I'm sitting. And I kind of jump up. And I was like, oh, my God, what the fuck? I can't believe this is happening. Like, I felt like I was just meeting my destiny or something. It was very surreal. Um, so I played... And um, Kenny took me on, and we did like six shows over the course of three or four months. Um, really great shows. We played at Green Street State. My first show was at Green Street Station. I don't know how they got me in because I was underage. <laughs> and um, Bullet La Volta and the Pixies opened that show. Oh, that's a famous show right there. <laughs> yeah. I've heard people have talked about that one. Yeah. And. Um, you know, I think we played, we did like Billy, an outdoor. Billy Ruin, right? Put it together, Yeah, right? totally. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was before Pixies had put out Come On Pilgrim. So they were just like this weird, you know, I didn't know what to make of them really at the time. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, long story short, I played with the Targets for that summer. Went back to high school, finished high school. I got into Emerson College and... Um, I didn't apply to any other schools because at that point I felt like I had my foot in the door in the Boston music scene, you know, which was all I ever wanted. So I went to Emerson the next year and Kenny had, um, had joined Bullet La Volta at that point because Corey Brennan left to go do his dissertation in Greece. And um, Chris Guttmacher told the band that after he recorded the gift, he wanted to leave the band because he he didn't like touring. He didn't like sh you know sharing floor space and people strangers' houses. He just it wasn't his his jam. So, um, really early on in um, the school year of 1988, they kind of said like, "Look, Chris is going to be leaving right before the gift comes out. So, do you want to audition?" And I auditioned for La Volta, and it was actually kind of rigorous. Like they um. They tried out a lot of people. Like I would say 20, 25 drummers um wow. cycled through there. And then um do you remember Ezra Demon Qualities? Do you remember that band? Yes, I do. They they did this Sunday, every Sunday they did sort of like a residency at the rat called Ed's Basement on Sunday nights. And um I just went to one of them and Tom Johnson was down there. He was Lavolta's manager yeah. at the time. Oh, yeah, Tommy. He, and he just said, uh, congratulations. And I was like, on what? And he was like, oh, you're in the band. And I was like, you're the first person to tell me. Like, I hadn't heard yet. So, um, yeah. Well, you're, you're really easy to interview, man. You're like asking me all the questions before I even have to ask them. <laughs> I love it. So you didn't play on the gift at all, right? No, it's it's funny because I was in the band be way before the gift came out. Right. So like I, I did the whole so. touring cycle. I did the, the record release party. But, but no, Chris wanted to finish that out before he left and um it's almost like i was in the band even as they were finishing the recording of it they, they knew that i was going to be the the replacement did they put um, your name on the record i don't think so no i don't think so i don't know why i thought you might have played on some of those songs on that record i love that record by the way that's, oh it's that's a great record. well yeah, well, my favorite song we'll talk about in a minute is between the lines and you played on that and that's on swan dive you know mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um okay so at the at that at this point you're in the band tommy's your manager did they have the rca deal at that point no i can totally get into that we had no intention or at that point you have to realize this is years before nevermind came out right the only bands in our sphere that had been signed at that point was like sonic youth had their geffen deal um 
God, I don't even know who else. It was, you know, barely anybody had major label deals. It wasn't even on our radar. It was nothing we ever thought about. And we played the record release party for The Gift and we sold out the channel. I mean, it was, wow. it was huge. Um, do you remember oh, who was on that bill with you? I like asking. I do. Questions. Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. You ready for this? Yeah. It was um, <laughs> from opening to headlining. It was um, Galaxy 500 first. Ooh. Buffalo Tom, Lemonheads, and then Blue LaVolta. Wow. Yeah, that was a great a show. show. Excellent show. Um, so we did that, and then we went to Europe with the Lemonheads, LaVolta. And, you know, they were all, we were all really good friends with those guys. Yeah. They, you know, a bunch of them all went to Harvard together. And, you know, it was like, it was like this family. Um, we went to Europe, and it was, it, it exceeded our wildest dreams. Like it just the crowds were ravenous. Um, Mud Honey had been over there. A couple of sub pop bands had gone over, and just like indie American guitar rock was taking over the the European circuit. It was it was in every show was sold out and just packed and just so much fun. They treated us well. Um, we got back. I guess in July, it was like an eight week tour and the Lemonheads blew up over there too. Like they were even thinking of breaking up after that tour, but they, they did so well. Um, just on that tour, they decided to stick it out and continue <laughs> and continue yeah. on. So we got back and um, RCA and Atlantic were interested in us just because they had heard what was going on over there. They'd heard the gift, the reviews for the gift were all extremely positive and um we went and played a gig at CB's in July of 89 that was sold out. And um, right after that, we got offers from both labels. And the guy who ended up signing us was this guy, Bob Fiden at RCA. Yeah, yeah. He was a legend. Um, he had sort of, we went with him because he was sort of instrumental in getting Patti Smith signed to Arista. And he knew really good music. He's punk rock at heart. And um, Bob Buziak, who was the president of RCA at that time, um, he was like a Detroit guy. So he was into the Stooges and the MC5. And that was totally so our way. So we he trusted totally him. Got yeah, he yeah, got, he got, got us. We, we trusted him. We ended up signing some huge, crazy, you know, seven record <laughs> deal or something with them. Um, and do, you they... remember, do you remember who at Atlantic was uh, pursuing you at the time? Some guy named Graham. Graham. Um, Graham. Hmm. Can't remember his last name. Did you, did you know Donna Hood? Donna Hood, yeah. She was yeah. a big, Yeah, we, we've talked about... I remember there was like these only a few of these Bullet LaVolta jackets, and I had one of them. Yeah, she had one. She had one. And yeah. one other person had one. My and a, a girlfriend has now. So... <laughs> <laughs> The guy she was dating was this guy Graham at Atlantic. I, I can't remember his last name, but uh, you know, he worked directly under Amit and like he was Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember Wilson or something. I think I know the like guy that. you're talking about. I was yeah. just curious because I think uh the Lemonheads ended up signing over there at that time. It, exactly. I think they signed with him. Um so we did that, and what happened was the gift was only like 60 days old at that point. And so RCA bought the rights from Curtis, repackaged it. And then re-released it. And we went on, oh my God, that fall of 89 was just, we we were on tour nonstop. And, and we you're like only like not even 20 years old at that point. 19 right? years old. I was wow. 19. Yeah. Um, so we go on the road that September and it was like, we would do a week with Mud Honey and then a week with the Fluid. And then we hooked up with Butthole Surfers in the Northwest. And we were coming back across to... Um, do some shows with Afghan wigs in the Midwest. And while we were driving, we were invited on Stone Garden's Louder Than Love tour. Yeah. So we got right, you know, we were like in Boston, we had like a day or two off and then we hooked up with Sound Garden. We were with them for six weeks um, all through the U.S. They were great. Um, they were totally, like, they were, they were such a pro operation like, compared to us. I, we had never seen anything like it. You know, they already had a tour bus and they had a crew and that whole, you know, we, we had not been exposed to anything like that ever. Um, and they treated us really well. Um, still friendly with all those guys. 
today. Um, yeah, and then... Give me danger. Give me uh, danger. We needed something in between the records. Uh, yeah. Did you work at Metal Blade? Yeah, I, I did. I worked okay. on that record. And it's funny because I ended up at AM and I worked on Soundgarden, but it was after Louder Than Love. It was like the their later records. Okay. And um, so I got to see them a lot of times. So I know exactly what you what you're such, talking about. Such nice guys. Um wait. Did you work for relativity? Was that or Enigma? No. I did work for, I've worked for a lot of people. <laughs> I worked at Enigma, but I was at Metal Blade when the, we did this deal with RCA and it was you guys and Circus of Power and yep. it was a few other bands. That's And we also worked on Soundgarden's first record. That's how I ended up getting to know Brian Huttenhauer at AM. and What would happen is these major labels would come to us and my mm -hmm. marketing department and say, we need you guys to deal with mom and pop retail, college radio, and get the buzz going. Totally. And that's, yep. how, you, that's how you guys were on my radar. But I had seen the band. I don't know, know if you were in the band when they were in the Rumble, but I was a judge the night that they played the Paradise Theater. That's the first time I saw mm -hmm. Vol the Volta because I lived in L.A. at that time. You know, I, went, okay. I went to L.A. in 80, 83, so I was already out there. But I used to come to Boston a lot because I signed the outlets, neighborhoods, straw mm -hmm. dogs. You know, I had a lot of Boston connections, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but I thought that was beforehand. That was but, before I joined. Yeah. Yeah. But Give Me Danger and the, then the Hungry Rabbit single, I remember when those came out. And then and that then Swan Dive happened. Who, who produced Swan Dive? Dave Jordan. Yeah. Big yeah. producer you guys end up getting. What was that like? It, okay. Um, we were excited to work with him because he engineered Remain in Light. And that was one of our favorite records of all time. So that was what RCA was stoked because he had just done Jane's Addiction and everybody yeah. was going crazy over Jane's yeah, Addiction, yeah. you know. Um, so he'd done Jane's and he did um, the first Alice in Chains. He did the first two Alice in Chains, but at that point he'd only done the first Alice in Chains. And so it just seemed like the right fit. You know, he knew like what was happening oh, with yeah. Grunge and all that shit. And um, next thing we know, we uh, flew out to LA and did that. Um and then it was like textbook major label scenario. Bob Fyden had to leave the business because he was not well. Um, he had some health issues. And so our A&R guy left. Uh, Bob Buziak got fired <laughs> while we're making the record. They bring in Joe Galante from RCA Nashville, who still runs RCA Nashville, right? Um, and he didn't understand us at all. Like, he didn't get it. He didn't re He didn't see the tea leaves of what was about to happen, because here's what happened. Swan Dive came out in September of 91, right? The four weeks surrounding our release date, Metallica's Black Record comes out, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Soundgarden's Bad Motor Finger, yep. <laughs> Pearl Jam's 10, Nirvana's Nevermind, <laughs> Pixie's Trump Lamond. So it's like every other label knew exactly what was happening. <laughs> And RCA decided to just like basically not do shit with Swan Dive and they put all of their resources into the new Lita Ford record that came out that month. Um, People always ask me what 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 bands do you think like to me, it's a travesty. I don't understand what happened with Bullet La Volta. I Well, I do. You know what you're, yeah. what you're saying, but still it made no sense. I mean, this is a band that everyone knew is great. Well, I mean, like I mentioned before, Between the Lines, I think, is one of the best straightforward hard rock tunes with melody in the middle of it. Great chorus. Great. You know, it's just you. a great song, man. You know, and then Thanks. Jordan was so hot because he ended he did social. D, he did a lot mm -hmm. of people. He was a great producer. So you had the table was set. And it's, so it's, for me, I don't this, think we. I don't think we had the mass appeal of those other bands I was just listing talking about, but we definitely had more appeal than like, you know, babes in Toyland. you know, that, that stuff's hard to listen to, you know, and they did well. Um, you guys rock though. It didn't matter <laughs> that you didn't have a, you know, that yucky guy wasn't Chris Cornell, you know, right, you guys right. still rocked harder than like so many bands. And that's Our why it's hard to understand. Our strength happened. was our live show. I mean, we were, really good live like i felt like we could take on any band 
you know, even the bad brands at their peak, you know, I'd be like, bring it on, you know, we will destroy you. Like we were just, and so capturing that on record was difficult. Um, like I said, the label wasn't behind us. We did that tour. We felt really like rock compared to prong and COC. Like that didn't really fit. Um, and then we asked sub pop had always put out our shit in Europe. Um, so we asked RCA, we were just like, look, can we just have Sub Pop do the European release? Because <laughs> you guys obviously aren't into this, into it. And they did. And uh, we went over and we had a great tour over there for, for Swan Dive. It, you know, it worked perfectly because they knew exactly what to do over there. And so that was that, that was good. And that's how we ended it. We um Yeah, how why? How how and why did it end? Uh, um it was really because we had options. Um, Billy Corgan was a really huge admirer of ours and pumpkins in the early days had opened up a few shows for La Volta and they were exploding. And basically we got back from the European tour in July of 92 and they were starting a huge tour in that fall. And they asked us to open and when we got that invitation. Um, Yucky just sort of called a band meeting and said like, you guys like, he had a one-year-old son. The band wasn't paying the bills. And he thought we would continue without him, but we were just like, there's no way we're gonna continue changing our singer. Like that never works, right? So um you, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> no, it would not he, was have worked. The, he was the guy for the band for yeah, sure. He felt really bad. We were we were heartbroken. I mean, it had become difficult. I mean. We, were, we weren't making any money. I don't know what we would have done label wise at that point. So him leaving, we were just like, all right, let's end on a high note. Played a couple of farewell shows in Boston and that was it. Yeah. Well, folks, you would think that would be the end of the Todd Phillips story, but it was <laughs> <laughs> because in a way you ended up really ended up in the right place at the right time. And why don't you tell us how, Juliana Hatfield came into your life because okay. some of the biggest things you did were pretty much with Juliana, correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I told you about that summer with the moving targets. Um, we played an outdoor show, an outdoor target show in Portland, Maine with Gang Green and Murphy's Law. And uh, it was 4th of July of 1987. <laughs> Gang Green, Murphy's Law, Lemonheads, Targets, Kill Slug were supposed to play, but didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um anyhow um the blake babies were huge fans slash friends with the lemonheads at that point and so i met juliana and frida at that show and just became friends with them immediately so i'd been friends with juliana for years and the whole time that i was in la volta juliana and i were roommates we lived um, oh really yeah we lived in this apartment on symphony road which was known as the condo pad. And it was like, Jules lived there. Evan lived there for a while. Dando, myself, some other people. Um, is that in Boston? Yeah, it's on Symphony it's Road, right near Symphony Hall. Down, okay. Just, okay. Yeah. Um, so we were down there and Juliana, I'd played on Hey Babe. She made a solo record. Yeah. And I was still in Bullet La Volta, but I had some time off. And so I played all the drums on Hey Babe. So I was okay, kind of so you her weren't drummer. With her, you weren't with her yet, but right. she asked you to play in there. Okay, because yeah. I know that's the first thing you played on. Okay. So she went on tour for Hey Babe when I was on my last uh, La Volta European tour. She was touring the States for Hey Babe with some other drummer. And I was in Europe with La Volta. And we got back, we broke up. And she basically called me from like Los Angeles. And she was like, I'm really sorry. Are, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. She was like, can you go on tour September 2nd? <laughs> like I have this other tour lined up or September 20th. And I was like, sounds good. So basically La Volta, we played our last shows, I think September 17th and 18th of that year. And then two days later, I went out with Hatfield. And, and you remember was... the dates. That's pretty good. Well, I just remember I had two two days off. Wow. Yeah. And then I was just Back but out. you knew all the songs already. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I played all the songs. So <clears throat> we did that tour. Um, One of the guys that I was really good friends with, Dean Fisher, went to high yeah. school with Juliana, and he became the third part of that ensemble. Sorry. The Julie, Juliana Hatfield Three. 
That's right. We were really into Spaceman 3, so we were like, let's, <laughs> let's name yeah, it. I was going to ask you about that because, you know. It's, well, it's... we were like, do we name a group, uh, you know, Patty Smith group or band? And we were just like, three, three sounds good. Um, you know, become what you are uh, with you and Julianne and Dean. That's like the that's a huge, you know, my sister, supermodel. I mean, what was that all? What was going on in your head during that time? Because uh, who recorded that? Got lit. Who is um? He right. did all the REM Scott records. Lit. Yeah. yeah. So totally I've worked with some you. great producers. You have. Yeah. You have. Um, we toured for Hey Babe, and Jules Juliana had become a chair pretty much already written in her head, and so we had a um, like a, I think a ten day <clears throat> break from touring for Hey Babe, and we went down to her mother's house in Duxbury, Mass. Yeah, and we yeah. just we just shedded all of the songs that would end up being on Become What You Are. We just like learned them, we arranged them, we got got them together and totally tight. And then we went back on the road for Hey Baby, but we played a lot of the Become What You Are stuff just to get it, you know, get it solid. And um, we went out with B-52s um, for a couple of, for like a month. And you know, I got to tell you, I interview a lot of people and they don't remember who they toured with, what they do. You remember oh, I, everything. Tom, I have you? one of those. <laughs> I have one of those. Um, you can't say, what did you do June 7th, 2000? But I do remember pretty much every day of my life. It's weird. Um, Can I ask you what your major was at Emerson? Just out of curiosity. Film. Film. Film yeah. major. Yeah. And actually that's what my life is now. Yeah. But, um, did, did so, you yeah. know did you know did you know when you first heard these songs my sister and supermodel like when you heard my sister did you know right away like i knew right away oh. because that's when i i heard i had heard my sister before dean joined and i took him out for drinks i was like you have to join because i heard the song and like <laughs> this is this is totally going so to you happen you knew that was going to be the song i knew the second i heard her just play it on her guitar like with no accompaniment yeah um, so we were out with B-52 it's funny but the memory thing let's go back to that Juliana does interviews all the time and I usually get like sort of runoff phone calls from whoever was talking to her because they're like she said you would know the answer to this question because <laughs> I have the, the memory that um, <laughs> you know um, so yeah so we were out with B-52 Scott Lit came to see us Automatic for the People had just come out and we loved I mean REM had gotten a little stale for me. I wasn't a huge fan of Out of Time or or Green, those records. Um, yeah. Automatic came out. We thought it was like a real return to form. Like we loved it. Listened to it in the van a lot. Um, so Scott Lick came out and he saw us open for B-52s at Radio City Music Hall. And um, after the show, he was just like, let's do it. <laughs> like awesome. So... Wow. Finish that. We finished that tour, and then we were whisked back out to LA. I stayed in the same apartment complex that I'd stayed at with Lavolta when we made Swan. Was time. that the Oak Oakmont? The Oakwood. 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 Oakwood, right? Yeah. Of course, you stayed at the Oakwood. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, felt like so, I've spent more time in the Oakwood over those two years than I did at my apartment. You know. <laughs> so the way things started blowing up during that period, and Julian is on the cover of you know NME and all these magazines. You you all were, you know. I mean, yeah. it must have like made you feel a little better about the the debacle that happened with Bo Lavolta. It must have like eased the pain a little bit. It was a soft landing, definitely. I wouldn't say. I mean, I love her music, but I think at that time period, my heart was still with heavier stuff. Yeah. You know, so it was a, def a huge shift. Like, I, you know, uh, the LaVolta guys were really good friends with Government Issue and Jawbox. And Jay Robbins, yeah. came, Jay, Jay Robbins came to a Juliana show at in D.C. And he was just like, wow, this is really different for you, huh? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, it's, it's different. But, um, I worked on the U record, uh, Government Issue. Uh, my Jay's, favorite jay's on that one yeah that record's brilliant oh my like, god that and crash was a great record too. yeah yeah both of those giant giant records um yeah. i there's a lot to talk about that's why i'm trying to keep mm -hmm. it moving now yeah. it's at some point um after that please do not disturb mikey welsh mm -hmm. came in and you played so it was with was it the three of you yeah he he and i were just he he and i become pals um 
just drinking buddies. Like, I don't know. I don't remember how I met Mikey, but I did. And he had been a LaVolta fan and he was, you know, tooling around and like playing with like left nut <laughs> and Jocko Bono. Left nut. That's a Portland band, right? Portland I don't band. know. He's playing with like these bands. You know, he sort of played in the Heretics a little bit and he was a great, great bass player. Yeah. Um, Rest and in so, peace. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't Jules... mention Bill Whalen before. You know, I should have mentioned that before. Bill's yeah. no longer with us. Yeah. We lost Bill last year, a year and a half ago. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, he he was struggling with mental issues. So, um, yeah, that was tough. But um, Mikey, yeah, Mikey and I were just like thick as thieves. You know, I would hang out every single day and so juliana needed a bass player and i was like you got to try out this guy he's great and well um, you introduced juliana to mikey well yeah 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 totally That's pretty cool yeah and we did some touring off that record and then we recorded bed with mikey welsh yeah, yeah. and while we were recording bed um juliana and i were friends with the weezer guys um Ooh. And Rivers was in Boston yeah. going to Harvard at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so he kind of poached Mikey from us wow. and, with, with yeah. our blessing, you know. The timing with... makes sense on that for sure. Yeah. I'm looking at yeah. the dates. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He played on the green record. Exactly. And actually, he and I moved out to LA together. Like he moved out he to did. join Weezer. And then I, I followed him like a month later, you know. Yeah. So you guys were really close. Super, super close. Wow. Yeah. I'm learning a lot here, Todd. Good. Um, okay. <laughs> um, other star people. Ugh. I mean, I love Jennifer Finch. You know, I got I to do know, too. I got to know her when she, you know, when um, L7 and Down by Law used to share a rehearsal space over at Dave Naz's place in Beverly Hills. Oh, yeah. And I went over there with Dave Smalley. You probably know Dave Smalley. Of course. And we went in. And he's like, oh, this other band's practicing in there. And we could hear him. And I'm like, oh girl singer and we went in and it was l7 it was mm -hmm. before they were like but so you ended up in this band and they ended up on a m and it was right after i left because i worked at AM for seven years but it was the end of a m when you guys got there pretty much right here's was, what happened they were they were signed with jeff suey over at a &M. Yeah, i know um, yeah yeah i worked with jeff and basically finch i'd stopped playing with juliana we just like kind of run our course like it had been you know years and years and i told her i was moving to la with, with mikey and finch was a lavolta fan and she heard i was coming to town and she asked me to if i would join her new project and i've said yeah you know i need a band to play in um came out it was not my cup of tea exactly but i love jennifer like a sister um i was happy to do it but it, it was definitely not my um not my thing musically but. yeah but <laughs> yeah but the record producer oh roy thomas baker <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean come on man you get to work with roy thomas baker huge producer um greg bissonette actually played a, most of that record before i got there oh he did yeah the session oh, okay. guy yeah. yeah yeah he played with david lee roth exactly yeah um Here's the funny thing about the AM thing and why I decided to give this a shot is the debacle happened, right? Interscope sort of ingested Geffen, AM, it became, and they dropped 90% of all of the rosters. Oh, yeah. And but all Jimmy the people I that worked there. <laughs> Jimmy Ivey called us, Jimmy Ivey and Tom Wally fucking called us into their, their office. They were like, we're, we're, we're keeping you. We like the record. And I was just like, oh my God, like this actually might happen, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, we toured for about six months. We went out with Queens of the Stone Age on their first tour, and that was really you did. exciting. Oh, yeah. You've been on some great tours, Todd. Oh my yeah. God, you've toured with everybody. Yeah, it's been good. The whole thing's, I mean, I feel unbelievably fortunate, and I don't take any of it for granted. I feel like it's just been incredible. Um, now I, I know you ended up going doing more records with Juliana, but in between there was model actress. Oh yeah. <laughs> you didn't remember that? <laughs> I remember model actress. That was that, that, was... that there was a little buzz there for a minute with that I band. Was, that was just okay, let me try to explain that. So I after the other star people, I switched into film, right? I uh, I became a film editor 
I learned the Avid editing machine, which nobody knew at the time when I when I learned it. And um, first job I got was at a, a movie trailer house, you know, an advertising house for films. Didn't even know they did that outside of film studios. I thought they made the trailers at the studio, but no, it's like every other product. Like if a company does the advertising for Coca-Cola, there's a company that does the advertising for Avatar, you know? So um, the guy hired me because he said that, drummers made the best trailer editors it's all cut to music it's all super syncopated and so i did that and i got good at it um i started finishing trailers pretty quickly my first big finish was um god i don't know zoolander really the original wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah black That's... hawk down um then i started working on huge movies like troy and last samurai and you know just Big, big, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I was doing that. And my buddy Juan was in this great band called Brainiac. Okay. Uh, from Ohio. Um, he equipped music and he was working in film also. And then my friend Curtis, who was in this great band <laughs> called Chamberlain. Did you know them? Split Lip? Ch Chamberlain? Kind of rings a bell, but I usually think I know every band, but that one doesn't, I don't remember. They were from Indianapolis. They were kind of part of that, um, like braid, like late '90s emo stuff. Okay, he moved to town. He was working on film. He needed to join it. You know, he was he quit music. The three of us all just started hanging out as friends. And um, Adam Wade, who's the, the original Jawbox drummer and the original yeah. Shutter to Think drummer, um, yeah, or yeah, the second yeah. Shutter to Think drummer, really um, good. He was just like, let's let's rent out a rehearsal space and work on some songs. So I moved to guitar, Adam played drums, and then both Curtis and Juan played bass because that's what they played in their band. So we had two bass players. And we made an EP and this this cool little label from Chicago put it out, Thick Records. Um, but we never... It was more of a fun project. We were all so submerged in our careers. Yeah, it was really just to, just to have fun. So. How did Juliana convince you to come back in, uh, uh, what is it, Whatever My Love was like the reunite oh, you and Dean love. and Juliana got back together. How, how had, did okay? I had been working my ass off um, in marketing. I'd actually become the vice president of the of a company that I was working for, and it was just a huge amount of work. I mean, I was working like seventy hour weeks, working on enormous campaigns, and um, I decided to take a sabbatical in twenty twelve. Like I was just burned out. I couldn't work anymore it had, been, it had been like a 13 year run of a lot just really intense work um so i decided to take a break and evan asked me to go out with lemonheads in 2012 so i went That's out with right. lemonheads um for a couple of years i went out with lemonheads for, for a couple of years there and then juliana said she was making a new record if i wanted to play on it and i said yes and while we were organizing that, I said, you know, why don't you just ask Dean <laughs> if he wants to do it? Because that'd be a great story. And so Which Dean it came was. down. <laughs> yeah. So we uh we ended up making another another three record. And then I forgot about the Lemonheads because you didn't really plan any of their records, but you I've, toured with them. I still do. Yeah. Like we um every few years I'll go out with him. Yeah. Um, I just got this is kind of a sidebar, but did you ever cross paths with Jesse Perez? Because he's been out doing Hollywood stuff for a while. I see him. No, I mean, I've bumped into him a few times when he's out here doing work, but we have not hung out. Um, Clay from La Volta, he's in film, he's in film too, and he uh, he and Jesse are good friends, they hang out a lot. I see Jesse's name on so many things. He's oh, he works just... on great series, like yeah. uh, streaming series. He worked on Girls, um, yeah. Clay orange, orange is the new black. Yep. I mean, Clay Tarver. Um, he was instrumental in Sil Silicon Valley, the Mike Judge series. Clay yeah. wrote and directed a bunch of those, and he's directing um he's directing a movie for Fox right now, um, Vacation Friends, and he's doing the sequel to that. It's like yeah, it's incredible how all these Boston guys just that were great musicians and great bands all ended up in the film industry and doing so well, you know, John yeah. Anastas is some marketing executive out and he's a millionaire on LA. You know, totally. Show, you know, it's, it's, just, it's, the, it's the guitarist of, um, 
the original boss tones guitarist and he's some big music yeah he's now. a he's a big wig too nate, nate yeah yeah he, yeah it's it's incredible man um Let's see where where are we? So you did you played on Weird too in 2019. Yep. So you mm -hmm. keep you and Juliana keep coming finding each other. She is a friggin' machine, man. <laughs> she you know, she's put out like 20 something albums in like 20 something years. It's incredible. Yeah, she's especially since like um <clears throat> the time we're talking about, like since 2015, she's put out every year she either puts out a new batch of her own stuff or one of those cover records that she's she's been doing yellow is um, next ELO's yeah is coming in, totally. in the fall <laughs> um and so we are going to we haven't announced it yet but i think we're gonna do a um a 30th anniversary tour for become what you are really it's at some point next year yeah so this in the is works. A scoop in the works <laughs> nice yeah. Well, I, I don't, you should. I mean, that record is just, a, you know, hey, listen, to say it's her best record is saying a lot because <laughs> there's so many good ones. There's so I many mean, good ones. Geez, yeah. I mean, the the thing that blows my mind is if you listen to the, the police record in the, um, what was the other one she did? Olivia Newton John. Oh, my God. These are brilliant albums. Yeah. I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. I and love I, them. ELO yeah. is going to be good too. It's going to be know? great. No, she's so, she's a machine. I feel like she should be way more famous than she is. Like she's just. Like, I she's think you know. I think of her as being really famous. Though she you is know, really famous. Even yeah. though I used to, when I was living in in Somerville, and I had a girlfriend that lived in uh, Inman Inman Square. Uh, is it Inman? Yeah, Inman. Yeah, and yeah. and I'd see her walking around with her dog. Yeah, she used to like, live right right near there. Yeah, she lived in the the two houses next to S and S Deli. Well, I had mm -hmm. a, my girl ex girlfriend lived in one of them. You probably know it, Chili Kurtz. I she took my apartment. Chili Kurtz took your apartment. Uh, that top floor apartment was yeah. mine. Be right before I came to L.A., that was I my apartment. I slept in that apartment a zillion times. <laughs> Al, Al Carrier had that building. Yeah, wow. that was his building. Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. wow! So you know Chili then? Is she? What's she doing? I mean, this interview isn't about her, but she owns owns a dog walking business. <laughs> she hasn't awesome. been doing music for a while, but Cage T was around for a long time. Her band Cage yep. T, blues blues rock band, you know, and she's Amazing. really good. Yeah, wow, that apartment with that that building Where... was falling apart, but I loved it. You know, what's up with it with Alan Carrier? What's his deal these days? <laughs> I I haven't seen Al Ali Baba <laughs> Ali in a Baba. long time. I haven't yeah. seen him in a long time, but you know he's a good guy, man. Oh know? well, Jill Kurtz, are you ready for this? She did all the photos for yep. Gimme Danger. I knew yeah. that. I knew yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think she was roommates with Kurt, right? Yucky, were they roommates <sighs> or Kenny? Kenny, maybe. Maybe I thought she might have been living in the Causeway loft at that time. Yeah, but... she was in a loft. I didn't. Okay. I don't know who was there, but when she was with Al, they lived down on Causeway. Yep. I wasn't around them, but I heard <laughs> all the stories, man. I've Wait, so let me all. ask you something about your career. Did Did you work with um, Game Theory by any chance? On Enigma? I did. They were on Enigma. Yeah, Real uh, Nighttime Record. I love them. I love that band. Yeah, Scott yeah. Vanderbilt, who was their manager, and I were we started Restless Records together at, oh. uh, un, under the Enigma umbrella. So and the bags, the bet the bags got signed after I had left. Okay. I wanted to. <laughs> I had gone to Roadrunner, and I took the neighborhoods, and I wanted the bags too, but I could only get one. <laughs> So I got the <laughs> yeah. but i love the bags behind you know oh god yeah. brilliant yeah. brilliant yeah. band yeah it's amazing that well we never really talked to each other we cross paths a lot but yeah i saw totally. you play a lot of shows you know i so knew I'm, in the back of my head that you had something to do with the uh, gimme danger uh that time period yeah. yeah oh yeah we didn't do it we there wasn't a lot we could do because rca was like you said in shambles at the time it was in shambles and, but i remember coming to your office it was in the flat iron building, right? You know what? Maybe we did meet in that office now that I think of it. Because I went in there and I took a bunch of, I took a stars. You, remember, you guys had reissued stars. Yeah. Maybe we did meet that at that I time. I think we met. I think we met yeah. up there. I'm yeah. sorry I don't remember that because I was definitely there then. Mike Faley was the guy that uh, coordinated the deal with RCA. Bennett Kaufman was, Bennett. you know, Bennett kind of tried to save 
the sinking ship. But yep, RCA right. never was what it was when David Bowie was on the label in those no. days. You know, it kind of went. A, you guys got there at the wrong time, man. It was it was bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I got to ask you something else before I let you go. I mean, do you yeah. listen to a lot of music these days and how do you listen to music? Do you, do you listen to vinyl, you stream? I mean, what, what's your deal with, with all that? Cause I, I know you're a music guy. Yeah. Um, i am listened to a lot of vinyl because I recently, a couple of years ago, I picked up an old Marantz 2270 and it made me fall in love with my records again. Wow. So buying a lot of records. Um, I stream a lot. There's not a lot of new stuff that appeals to me. New music. Yeah, it's, it's rough. It's few and far between. Um, I like a lot of the stuff that's coming out of Northern Africa, like Tanarawen. Um, that sort of... More eclectic. Yeah, that Saharan rock I think is great. Um, what else have I loved lately? I thought the most recent low record... You know, low from low, uh, yeah, they've been around for a while. They put out a record a few about a year and a half ago that was unlike anything I've ever heard. It like, made like, some top ten lists. I know. Yeah, that it was yeah. really good. Um, and you know, I like Lana Del Rey. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah, I'm she's sure you've you been keeping up with all Juliana's records. Do you listen? Oh, to totally. All I listen. To, I listen to everything she does intently because I, 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 you know, I have to end up learning it for live tours anyhow. You know, so but I'm, I'm a huge fan. So yeah, I listen to everything she does. Well, That's cool, man. Sure. Well, what a pleasure it's been talking to you, it's been, man. You're, it's you're, been easy. Your 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 memory is remarkable, man. It's truly if you remarkable. Ever, if you can't think of something. Give me a call and I'll probably have the answer to it. Well, you know, I'm waiting on Juliana. <laughs> Juliana's publicist has told me that she's going to eventually do the show and hopefully it's going to be before the ELO thing comes out. Excellent. And then, because I got to talk. I, I'm such a huge fan of hers, you know, that she's it's funny. You, you're, you were in two bands. And if you want to count the Lemonheads, three of probably my top 20 all time bands, not that's lying. That's great. You know? That is because great. Because you played in, that's why I wanted you on the show because I love your playing and you played in some with some great bands. Thank you so much. That's really nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. And, and All right. I, I wish I was out in L.A., man. I'll be there in September. You know, I'm going to be I'm going to be kicking around Boston. Uh, I go to Martha's Vineyard every summer at the end oh, of yeah. July. So I will. But I'm going to spend a week in Boston um, the first week of August. So maybe I'll give you a call and we'll. Uh, yeah, definitely, man. Get a coffee or something. Cool, man. All awesome. Right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Steve. See you later.